Hello everyone. I hope you are having a wonderful time. I'm Harish. I'm back today with a new story. But not the story that you might be anticipating. No, I'm not talking about Omicron, the new COVID variant. The entire world seems to be talking about it. But as you may be aware by now that at non-detail, I don't usually do the half uh, big stories. since uh, and the developing stories and since omicron is still a developing story i would rather wait and uh, discuss about it when I have enough details that i can cover in at this channel so so then what topic that i would uh, be talking today it essentially i, I would be discussing the three farm laws which are oh. repeat मैं आज देशवासियों से क्षमा मांगते हुए सच्चे मन से और पवित्र हृदय से कहना चाहता हूं कि शायद हमारी तपस्या में ही कोई कमी रही होगी जिसके कारण दिए के प्रकाश जैसा सत्य कुछ किसान भाइयों को हम समझा नहीं पाए आज गुरु नानक देव जी का पवित्र प्रकाश पर्व है ये समय किसी को भी दोष देने का नहीं है आज मैं आपको पूरे देश को ये बताने आया हूं कि हमने तीन कृषि कानूनों को वापस लेने का रिपील करने का निर्णय लिया है so the topic of uh, today's discussion is with this three farm laws now gone so what next what are the options left for us to improvise the indian agriculture sector thereby eventually improving the wealth of our farmers so the three farm uh, laws which are the farm which named as farmers to produce trade and commerce laws are repealed again in uh, uh, not again are repealed in the parliament again without any discussion if you remember these laws were passed in the in the parliament without any, any discussion previously and without sending it to any standing expert committee also in the rajya sabha the farmer bills are through but under very controversial circumstances take a look democracy wins so before i begin the topic i would uh, like to say that i'm happy that democracy prevailed at the end and this is how a functioning democracy looks like a party with more than full majority and with full conviction behind this laws yet at the end had to withdraw them uh, going down before the voice of the farmers so without getting into the uh, without get, right away getting into the merits and demerits of the of these laws i would like to say that it's a victory of democracy i'm i'm very happy with that why did the government pass these farm laws so what were these laws about they essentially paved uh, the path for investments into farming and farm marketing by the private players which would eventually change the holding pattern and structure of the farm land size sizes currently the farm size in india is very fragmented the average farm size in india is, is about 1.2 hectare and post this loss it was anticipated that slowly the farm size would increase and bigger the farm size then it's better for in a way to bring in innovations as big farms bring, bring in scale right so it it's easier and also cost effective to bring in those innovations so this was the broad idea behind the, these laws and why did the government think this is essential for india's farming so more than half of indians depend upon agriculture which it contributes 
which the agriculture contributes only 60% of india's gdp so if you relate if you connect more than half of Indi- indian indians are depending on only 60% of of india's gdp right so and for perspective in in america only 3% of americans are depend on farming essentially because farming is not a very profitable o- occupation so and 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 far an agriculture in india is growing at, at the rate of 3 to 4% while overall india is growing at at, at a substantially higher rate right which means families that are agriculture dependent are becoming poorer and poorer when come year by year when compared to the other yeah, indian families so by these reforms if the agriculture productivity increases and its growth rate growth rate increases then it would not only create wealth for the farmers it would it would also uh, uh, push the indian uh, growth rate f- further plus today india has around 81 million tons of grains and and by 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 the ideal buffer storage standard it should ideally should be around 31 million tons so even by this number the government has already procured 2.5 times more than grains that it ever would need hence these grains are still in the fci godons uh, most probably uh, they might uh, be uh, either exported at, at a subsidized rate or it it may may just rot in 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 the godons right and government has spent around 1.5 lakh crores to procure this 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 these grains so that's the burden which government is looking at currently and with these laws government was aiming to open up the market for private players thereby the hope was thereby to reduce the burden of procurement from the government to some some extent that the, this this is is one reason the other reason also could be government or government was looking at the environmental aspects for example the water table in punjab is depleting by 1 foot every year and in central punjab it's it's it's, it's depleting by 1 1 meter because we are essentially over producing than what we uh, need since it looks like uh, since uh, since uh, some reasons could be since the water uh, is freely av- available the, as a commod- commodity plus the electricity to pump this water is also in most cases is free and in some cases it's subsidy uh, subsidy based uh, by by the state, state governments so agriculture so so this kind of uh, yeah, leading into over production of of uh, the grains that we we would ever need so since we are over producing it would also mean that we we are re- releasing higher amounts of methane gas which methane is 80 times more dangerous than carbon dioxide so the more the agriculture it means the more methane we are we are, we are generating which is very dangerous for the as 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 uh, for the environment plus also every year we do see that uh, due to the stubble burning in delhi and in in and around delhi we see that uh, uh, there's a huge crisis of pollution right so considering both the economic prospects and and environmental aspects the government might have mulled, mulled these laws bigger farms equals more profit no let's question whether this understanding of bigger farms would mean more profitable farming are they directly correlated in in any any which way statistically speaking a 1% increase in farm size is associated with a 0.3% and 0.5% decrease in fertilizer 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 and pesticide need per uh, hectare respectively and an almost 1% increase in agriculture labor productivity while it only leads to statistically insignificant which is 0.02% decrease in crop yields so 
while economic growth has been associated with increasing increasing farm size in many western countries in china this relationship has been distorted by land and migration policies leading to the persistence of 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 farm size small farm size in china so similar to india even china has this uh, has this concern that their farms average farm size holding is smaller so removing these distortions would decrease the agriculture chemical use by 30 to 50% and the envir- environmental impact of these of those chemicals by 50% while doubling the total income of all farmers including those who move to the urban areas so this is one study which which uh, uh, is well established removing policy distortions distortions is also likely to complement other remedies to the overuse problem such as easing farmers access to modern technologies and knowledge and improving environmental regulation and enforcement india is blessed with the highest gross irrigated crop area in the world with abundant rain and sunlight we have abundant rain and sunlight but china with lesser land has been producing double the grains that we do india's average farm size holding is little over 1 hectare and in china it's 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 about 2.5 which is almost similar right in comparison because because when we compare it to the western world especially with america the average uh, farm size in us is 444 hectares so india and china is almost in the, on in the similar range then the question arises then how come china is producing higher throughputs when compared to india over the past four decades china has caught up uh, to the agriculture development that took the western world 150 years to achieve and that's that's how quicker uh, china has uh, improvised its agriculture throughput china's staple crops of corn rice and wheat all yield the most food per hectare at modest scales one study suggested the sweet spot of farm size is between anywhere between 5 to 17 hect- uh, hectares so if you got a very small farm a farmer is out there weeding and working very intensively uh this is this is a note by fred fred gale a senior economist at us us department of agriculture and crop yields per acre will ref, uh, usually ref, reflect that the crop yields per hectare is uh, when 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 done with manually yields higher than when done uh, through machines china's plan is not so china's plan is not to merge uh, the holdings of small farmers that because essentially china realized that it, it would be nearly impossible uh, logically and would also spur social disruption by uprooting millions of farmers right now we can you connect that with india what what's happening in india so for now at least the the idea of china is to cluster adjoining fields into farms the bengbu farm the bengbu farm displaced about 100 villagers and the government moved them to a little way down the road people in the village cooperated to the rental fee for the uh, willingly because officials promised them job also the rentals for fee for their uh, land so hence this is kind of a arrangement which china has been uh, getting into but in reality this doesn't always happen they do employ people uh they do provide jobs for the people but it's very limited because it's always about profit right if they want to make a profit the first thing they would want to is to cut sorry uh labor employment and they can em- hence they can employ a very limited amount of low paid farm workers so there's a two this is a story there's a story at the two, on the two sides of the coin right uh, even though china china chinese government is getting into this uh, arrangement with the farmers uh, promising them certain 
certain jobs plus rentals yet in 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 actuality this is not an ideal uh, arrangement because it uh, because essentially due to profitability uh, the the companies or the organizations are not employing a lot of them, a lot of chinese men and women so that that one aspect uh, and another reason for uh, which would go against having a huge farmlands is essentially when, whenever there is a contam- contamination it could spread far more widely and rapidly um, in 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 a in a centralized system when compared to a decentralized system so nearly uh, all uh, uh, huge farms are run in china are run by government its cooperatives and businesses experts may debate what size farm size would produce the most food per acre acre but industrial farms still generate profit far more readily than the smaller ones also china's organic sector has been booming with, with sales growing uh, growing as much as 30 fold since 2005 according to a recent uh, industry analysis report for consumers the appeal of small farms is twofold it's partly about trusting the farm to supply safe food we, we usually tend to trust our friendly neighborhood right when compared to a huge conglomerate of of of, of companies so but smaller farms also reflect china's agricultural traditions a, a lead, says a leading uh, scholar of rural, rural china and that appeals to uh, r- rural and urban chinese are like and that's also the reason why um, the, the the farm sizes in china uh, are smaller and that may also be a reason why it's it's small uh, the farm size is small in india as well because in essentially in asia the agriculture is almost 40 centuries old and over a period of time the, with with division with the division in the farm rate per generation eventually we would end up having much smaller farm sizes right it's it's a very organic way that that, it, that happens however two institutional features contr- are contributing to prevalence and persistence of small farm size in china they are the hc hcrs and the hukou system the hcrs allocates 98% of china's crop land to about 200 million uh, rural households with limited transferability estimates from several surveys and the recent national agriculture census suggest that the typical household farm size in china is around 0.5 hectare this is a typical farm not the average farm size which i discussed earlier and this is also under hcrs this average farm of 0.5 hectare is further divided into four to five parcels to ensure that both high and low quality land pieces are fairly allocated across households now you can imagine 0.5 hectare is again divided into uh, four to five pieces so in comparison indian farms are quite bigger than this uh, holdings right yet indian farming is not uh, uh, Is, is is not been able to com- compare and compete with chinese throughputs the hukou system is peculiarly chinese household re- registration system that divides chinese population into two categories rural and urban and regulates the migration of the r- rural population to urban areas under the hukou system rural migrant workers are often denied access to urban public services such as public health care and, and are discriminated against um, against the former uh, for, uh, formal uh, labor market as a result even though about 260 million uh, rural workers have managed to obtain jobs in urban areas the majority of them have not been fully integrated in the cities and 
which which essentially means they still own uh, the contractual rights out to to their crop land in the in 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 in, in, in their villages right this contributes this these two systems are uh, essentially contributing to the small farm size in in china and the chinese government has now recognized the the the, the consequences of this small farm sizes and hence since then they 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 are trying to consolidate the fragmented crop lands by promoting land transfer policies however they have not been successful in it and to till date these policies have not been effective due to high transaction cost that that uh, that, that is involved in transferring the lands right if the average farm size now there are certain studies uh, which 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 indicate that if average farm size increase to 3.3 hectare the fertilizer and pesticide pesticide use would fall by 26% and 46% respectively simultaneously fertilizer loss would be reduced by 47% crop yield and crop yield would not be reduced significantly and the income of the current farmers would increase by 114% small holder far- farmers income would increase by 239% due to their increased labor income from the non agriculture sectors and the additional land rents while large farm uh, hold farm holding holders would in, uh, in- income would increase by 30% due to the increased farm uh, area um, that they have that they would be managing if the f- and and if the farm uh, average farm size increased to 6.1 hectare the fertilizer and pesticide use uh, would fall by 33% and 51% respectively and the farmers increase uh, income inc- uh, would increase by 116% so when we compare uh, the with with the study now it's pretty clear that when when the average farm size is is at 3.3 hectare the farmers uh, in income would increase by 114% and if it, if the average farm size is at 6.1 hectare the farmers income is is increasing by 116% so if we compare it's so the uh, ideal farm size is somewhere near to 3.3 3.5 or probably 4 hectare uh, which is still uh, and the current uh, farm size average farm size in india is almost half of that ideal farm size big farms a necessary condition to increase farmers wealth so now the question again arises does this mean we necessarily need to have large farm to bring in innovations and to increase the wealth of the farmers may not uh, this may not be true in all 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 scenarios for example netherlands is is the world's second biggest exporter of agriculture products this is remarkable when one considers that the only country which tops the netherlands is united states and in and united states is Two thirty-seven times bigger in land area than when compared to Netherlands. Then how come Netherlands has 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 exported such huge volume? Right, that's that's the question which which lingers in everyone uh, in each of our mind. Netherlands exported al- almost hundred billion dollars in agricultural goods in two thousand seventeen alone, as well as ten billion dollars in agriculture. Are related products the secret to netherlands success lies in the use of agriculture innovation to re- reimagine what an agriculture landscape can look like uh, sorry look like the way in which the netherlands uses architecture to feed the world is best seen from uh, from the above or probably the satellite images these are the images which tom higgins uh, higgins has taken uh and uh, it's widely available on, on the web uh which which tells the greenhouse uh, st- uh series story of uh, the dutch agriculture and the dutch agriculture is 
defined by vast landscape of green houses. Some covering up to 175 hectares, hectares which, do, which, which is essentially dominate the agricultural landscape of South Holland. In, to, in total, the Netherlands consists of 36 square miles of greenhouses, which is an, when, to put in perspective, this is, a, this is an area 56% larger than the island of Manhattan. In the, in the Westland region, appropriately dubbed uh, the greenhouse capital of the Netherlands by National Geographic, greenhouses are stitched into the landscape f- filling the voids between the cities so in between each of the cities the netherlands have built these green houses um, uh, and natural geographic has done a story on this and it uh, it has uh, in, in, in which it elaborates that the land this that these landscapes are often often defined by banks of what appear to be gargantuan mirrors stretch across the countryside and these mirrors kind of uh, kind of shine when the when the uh, or glitters when, when when the sun shines, and it it, it's, it looks very glowing in in, in the in, in the when the when the light when when the lights are switched on inside these greenhouses, and it looks very beautiful, uh, and you can see them see, see that in, in the images. Underneath the, the sea of illuminated glass roofs, tech-savvy farmers use hydrophonic systems and geothermal energy to generate unparalleled yields using little resources. Dutch greenhouses use 1.1 gallons of water per pound of tomatoes produced. In contrast to the 25.6 gallon global average, with, with some farmers producing 100 million tomatoes per year from 14 hectares of land. So you can, in comparison, you can see how efficient the Dutch farming is. This is made possible due to, the, due to a controlled indoor en- environment where precise, reliable temperatures and humidities are, are married with low threat of contamination and no pesticides. Double glazed roofs allow for the retention of heat, while light modular steel frames allow for rapid expansion and, ad- and adaption without hampering natural light. Operators such as Duvich Duvich Jason, sorry if I I was not able to pronounce uh, his name. Uh, so operators. Uh, so, um, who, who are handling these greenhouses uh, are, are very innovative. Uh, for example, uh, one such opera, uh, operator ha- has been leveraging the carbon dioxide from a local shell oil refin- refinery and, pi- and has piped in, uh, that CO2, CO2 into the greenhouses to aid plant growth. While LED lights allow for plants to continue growing throughout the light. By 2050, we'll need to feed 10 billion people on the planet, which will be more challenging due to the impact, due to the climate change impact uh, this is going to have, right, on the soil as well as a lot of other clim- uh, clim- uh, climatic conditions. The r- result will be a need for greater agriculture yields using less water, less energy and less land. The recent World Resources Report warns if our current level of production efficiency uh, continues, feeding the planet in 2050 would require clearing most of the world's remaining forest. Imagine our, our Earth without any forest. Right? It, it, it's 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 it, it's it sounds very dreadful, right? Wiping out thousands of, which would wipe out thousands of species, and and really and it release enough greenhouse gas emissions to exceed the 1.5 degree centigrade and 2.0 degree centigrade warming targets uh, uh, that were enshrined in the Paris Agreement. Even if that this this is 
this would happen even if emissions from all other human activities were assumed to be uh, not existent so it's crucial that innovative agriculture techniques should be explored um, in 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 other countries as well like how uh, the netherlands has uh, done and scale up their agriculture um, this may need some short term commitments but it has a huge uh, long term benefits now the the next question that may arise is that netherlands the 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 this through their very ultra modern tech, technologies whether and whether it is possible in india a, a quick answer to that is well it may well be possible because it's, it's at the end it's a technology technology can be transferred and learned and implemented but what may be challenging is this adaptation adoption of the greenhouse technology would mean uh, it will be we mean very transformative for indian agriculture and and the farming and it would mean it would displace millions of farmers out of agriculture and then government would have to provide them other means of livelihood which is very herculean challenge right and going by what what is hap- currently happening in india this looks very infeasible uh, uh for the, for the political reasons Does that mean india has only two options left one is to let it conduct its farming the way it is doing today and the second option is to rock the boat through these farm laws <clears throat> but as you all, all as we all know the government has already failed in the second solution and it's quite possible that no other future government would even try any agriculture reform again for many years from now then what is the alternative at the policy level which could be a middle path do such option even exist yes we can explore many such options one of which could be what israel has done israel has not only managed to create a remarkable agricultural transformation but has emerged as a global leader in agriculture and water management israel approach in the 1950s and 1960s consistently showed visionary visionary leadership in a long term commitment to agriculture and and water in the early years 30% of of its national budget was devoted to agriculture and water with another 30% for uh, being devoted to education you can imagine 60% of was there was uh, assigned to agriculture and uh, and education which is quite phenomenal right from the beginning israel's farmers were either organized into well managed cooperatives or were private farmers represented by an influential 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 farmers association this connection to a larger unit of production is critical to facilitating their bargaining power enabling them to compete and function effectively giving access to finance research training farm inputs and markets the market always serves as a guiding star for planning prioritization and coordination for both the government and farmers crucially from the outset there was parallel development of both the domestic market for food self sufficiency and the international export market for economic growth right the market is also key for israel's agriculture research which has always been focused on how it can improve israel's competitive advantage in in target value chains this is how israel has come to lead the world in numerous products including dates pomegranates oranges and tomatoes israel has a farmer centric multidisciplinary multidisciplinary and innovative approach to solve farmer and private sector problems key to this approach is the golden triangle the close relationship between uh, with the global golden triangle here means the uh, uh, the close relationship between uh, researchers agriculture agriculture extension workers and farmers uh, and, and 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 definitely the government 
This is supplemented by agro industry, which is essential to commercialize innovative solutions and make them available nationwide. So with in this discussion now we have seen several possibilities and many options that the government can still explore or could have already explored. Instead of these, uh, it, the government thought it's a better idea to implement uh, or, or roll out um, those three laws with sheer brute force, which we know didn't really work. Well, how, how would it work? If you, if you in this discussion, in, in this discussion, we have seen this even in country like China, which is more authoritative and autocratic in nature, has not been able to combine their fragmented farms, and it, it, it has failed to do that. Right? <laughs> then, how imagining that India, in in with all its democratic setup would be able to do that was was maybe an overestimation on our part what happened in soviet union so what happened when a similar thing was tried and tested out in soviet union with where with um, so what was the result of that uh, approach Kulaks, the peasants in the Soviet Union, were wealthy farmers during Lenin, Lenin's times, as they could sell their produce wherever they wished. But when Stalin came to power in early 1920s, he saw this as he saw this as profiteering, which he thought it was against communist principles. So, without any consultations and, and discussions, he has ordered state control over the agriculture produce. This led to a power struggle and close to a million peasants were arrested or killed. Million peasants, million farmers, I mean, were either arrested or killed, which obviously would uh, follow, would lead into a white starvation across the Soviet Union. So, going with this example, we can see that when decisions are made with less or no consultations, and when these decisions are trusted upon us with force, the result is invariably always never as intended. Bad politics affect good policies. How does bad politics affect good policies? Talking about consultations, if we rewind and remember what was going around a few months or a couple of months before these bills were with the farm bills were tabled in the parliament. And when we answer this question, we would know how bad politics affect good policies so if you remember the entire episode episode uh, when the nation uh, whole nation was engaged into and the and the episode that i'm talking about is the susan singh rajput uh, ria and kangana and debate that that was carried out for several mon- months in, in 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 all the media outlets as well as in in common uh, discussions Discussions. Mumbai 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 police Sanjay Raut? Hey Sanjay Raut, Mumbai is your name? Mumbai is your name Sanjay Raut? Mumbai is my karma bhoomi, Mumbai is my name bhi hai. Listen to Sanjay Raut. Parambir Singh se sawal uthao ge to chhodenge ne, kyun ne chhodoge? Parambir Singh se to pura desh istifa maang raha hai Sanjay Raut. Tum kyun taraf dari kar rahe ho Mumbai Police Commissioner ki hai? Sushant case mein Maharashtra Sarkar कोई पार्टी नहीं है फिर अनिल देशमुख जी आप इतना भड़के हुए क्यों हैं शर्म नहीं आती हैं अनिल देशमुख कंगना रनौत को आने नहीं दूंगा कंगना रनौत कौन है मुंबई में ना अरे क्यों जागीरदार हो तुम मुंबई के हैं अनिल देशमुख कौन हो भाई आज आए कल गए आज गृह मंत्री हो कल वापस जाओगे ऑपोजिशन में कौन हो तुम कौन हो बताओ मुझे 
देश जानता है डरता वो है जिसे पकड़े जाने का खौफ होता है अनिल देशमुख और संजय राउत याद रखो ये बात कि डरता वो है जिसे राज खुलने का खौफ होता है डरे हुए हो तुम इतनी बौखलाहट इनकी बौखलाहट दोस्तों इनकी बौखलाहट का वजह मैं देश को बताता हूं आज उद्धव ठाकरे जी सवाल पूछने का अधिकार हम सबको इस मिट्टी इस देश के संविधान ने दिया है इस देश का एक एक कोना इस देश का इस शहर का हमारे मातृभूमि का और मुंबई का एक एक कोना हर हिंदुस्तानी का है दिस वॉज डन मियरली टू फॉर सो दैट इट कुड बेनिफिट and in the in the br elections so the, um, the ruling dispensation believe that by taking the story the sujan singh rajput story and by fueling it for several months it may prove advantageous for them in the bihar election, elections but then what was the opportunity cost of doing so what was the opportunity cost of that bad politics the opportunity cost and the cost that we paid is as these laws as why i say this as there was no time uh, left to discuss this form law form bills right entire media and everyone was too busy with with the sushant singh rajput's episode discussing it there was hardly any discussions about this form bills and probably in now I, when i rethink about it probably there there was never any intention by the government to draw any attention towards this laws they essentially wanted to kind of get this through uh, kind of more in a more hidden way than than widely publicizing it i don't know what was what was the reason so we so we thought whatever the reason, whatever whatever might be the reason without engaging without discussing without bringing in that deserved awareness among the farmers these very crucial bills were tabled in the parliament and they were passed bulldozing the opposition they were passed without any discussion they were passed without seeking any expert committee consultations right and it was always going to bite, bite back and it indeed did bite back so bad politics always invariably end up affecting good policies how government should have conducted itself how how should the government have conducted uh, while bringing in such crucial laws in 1991 pm narsimha narsimha rao cons- consciously slowed down the liberalization reforms at the risk of being labeled as too slow in decision making he was widely um, condemned that he is too slow in in, in decision making back in, back in those days no power on earth can stop an idea whose time has come the emergence of india as a major economic power in the world happens to be one such idea india is now wide awake we shall prevail we shall overcome these words were spoken during the 1991 budget presentation by then finance minister dr manmohan singh and ushered in a new age for india mai pv narsimha rao This budget was presented barely a month after Congress, which Sri Narasimha Rao as Prime Minister had taken back the reins of the country, and was tasked with recuperating a devastated economy. But it was quite quite consciously being done by Mr. Rao himself, as he wanted wider consensus to build. He he wanted uh, the mood of the nation to be set. so he he d- delayed his decision until the balance of payments issue reached a tipping point after which the nation was prepared and anticipated the reforms sooner than later hence when ref- reforms were actualized there were hardly any opposition since it was seen as an eventuality without which the nation would plunge into a crisis situation but the reality was that rao's government was has brought in reforms above and beyond 
what the IIM, IMF, the International Monetary Fund, has mandated. So it was pretty evident that these reforms um, were brought in due to the strong government's conviction, rather than uh, rather than uh, because of a reason why uh, because of IMF being a reason. The administration was so careful in handling handling the entire events that it gave a choice to all the bureaucrats who would be involved in implementing these reform plans. Uh, they, these bureaucrats were given a choice that they could move out to other departments if their ideology or conviction doesn't support privatization and or, or liberal liberalization. Rao himself preferred to stay away from. Uh, it and leave everything on Manmohan Singh, his finance minister then, to avoid any pol- or pol- pol- politicization of uh, of the cause or, or, or the initiative. With the PM staying aloof, it looked like the entire exercise was left to the experts and was apolitical. So, hence it was not uh, condemned or politicized. He, he brought in the subject matter expert Manmohan Singh to do the job for him and is interested upon him full trust and confidence while shielding him from political acquisitions. Rao back then ran a coalition government which was very shaky, close to being called as a lame duck government. Yet he was able to bring about such huge far reforms as the, uh, as the key was to bring in consensus and not to rock the political system. Uh, so he pushed everything very gradually with utmost care. He never, and when it was done, he never claimed claimed a victory through the uh, because he didn't want any politicization of these reforms. Now, when we compare how Rao, Rao's government conducted itself and how the current government conducted itself while while rolling out these reforms, there, there is a sharp contrast, right? And that contrast made all the difference. Maybe the brute majority in the parliament kind of masked, masked their understanding of the situation and has filled them up with this wrong sense of entitlement. An entitlement for tabling and passing any law as and when they wish without any cre- without creating any support or consensus or uh, without any discussion. But the pa- farmers have now shown that in this democracy, it's people who are paramount, who are paramount, and it's people who would prevail eventually. Thank you.